Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. All right, good evening, Team Crew Lag community. My name is Major Ian Brown. I'm the Operations Officer at the Brute Crew Lag Center for Innovation and Future Warfare. Yes, we have a new name, but the same awesomeness is there. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Krulak Center, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, United States Marine Corps, West Point Military Academy, the Australian military, or any other agency of the US or foreign governments. Uh, so, moving on to the, our guests. Uh, this evening, we are thrilled and very excited to bring you a discussion that we at Team Crew Lack have been trying to get onto the program for some time, some time, and we're very happy that it finally happened. We're going to talk about the numbers 66 and 33. That is 66 degrees, 33 minutes, which are the northern and southern latitudinal lines of the Arctic Circle and Antarctic Circle, respectively. Few cross these lines for any reason, though today more are doing so under the pretext of defense and security. Project 6633, based at Modern War Institute at West Point, is the first global initiative aimed specifically at advancing defense community discussions on security issues in the polar regions of both the Arctic and Antarctica. And tonight we have the two co-directors of the project, Drs. Elizabeth Buchanan and Ryan Burke. So Dr. Buchanan is lecturer of strategic studies with Deakin University for the Defense and Strategic Studies course at the Australian War College and a fellow of the Modern War Institute at West Point. She holds a PhD in Russian Arctic strategy from the Australian National University and was recently the visiting maritime fellow at the NATO Defense College. Dr. Buchanan has published widely on polar geopolitics, most recently with the NATO Defense College, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, the Australian, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and the Lowy Institute. She has been a visiting scholar with the Brookings Institution and has work experience in the global oil sector. Dr. Buchanan has two forthcoming books. The first is Russian Energy Strategy in Asia from ANU Press, and the other is Russian Arctic Strategy under Putin from the Brookings Institution Press. Our second guest today is Dr. Ryan Burke, who is an Associate Professor and Deputy Department Head for Curriculum in the Department of Military and Strategic Studies at the U.S. Air Force Academy. He is a two-term non-resident fellow with the Modern War Institute at West Point, Dr. Burke is also an affiliate faculty member with the University of Alaska Fairbanks School of Management's Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, as well as its Center for Arctic Security and Resilience. Additionally, he is the research director for the Homeland Defense Institute within the Air Force Academy's Institute for Future Conflict. Dr. Burke earned his PhD from the University of Delaware's Joseph R. Biden School of Public Policy and Administration. His research emphasizes military strategy and defense policy across the spectrum of conflict and is currently funded by the DOD's Minerva Research Initiative and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Dr. Burke has authored, co-authored, or edited greater than 50 publications to date. His latest book, The Polar Pivot, Great Power Competition in the Arctic and Antarctica, is forthcoming with Lynn uh, Reiner Publishers from the fall of 2021. Prior to his academic pursuits, Dr. Burke was also a U.S. Marine Corps officer and served as platoon commander, operations officer, and company commander during his fleet tour. So uh, if you all got the sense from the resumes, we have two very impressive guests here today to talk to about this emerging, uh, two emerging security zones. Um, we do have some tech issues with cameras, uh, but we'll make sure that we get uh, pictures of our guests up here for the YouTube video, so it's not just me talking at you the entire time. And so, uh, Dr. Buchanan, and Dr. Burke, both of you, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks for having us here, and we appreciate it. And again, to everybody who's listening, we appreciate the uh, flexibility with the time. We know it's uh, it's a little bit different, but uh, Liz being out there in Canberra, uh, it's actually Tuesday morning for her. So we're, we're we're appreciative of everybody's time, and we know it's a it's a different uh, schedule tonight. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can confirm from the future that tomorrow comes. Well, that is that is definitely good to know because there have been some days where uh, I think we've all kind of wondered that. Um, so to to get things going, um, first of all, if both of you could sort of talk about Project sixty six thirty three, uh, how did it start? How did the two of you specifically get involved with it? Um, what kind of uh, what what drove it to be under the Modern War Institute of West Point? 
and uh, and just kind of the the, bat, the basics of it. I think this is for you, Liz. You had the uh, this is your brainchild. So why don't you take it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a bit far, but um, basically, Ryan and I kind of connected. I think fundamentally, as both realists right you know hard power um strategists when it comes to the polar regions and i think we'd followed each other's work for quite a while um and we'd seen in various kind of conversations that that discussion is missing that really focuses down on the defense and security developments in the polar regions um you know that's not to undermine the environmental and the socioeconomic development concerns that are ongoing um, in these regions, but we felt that it was kind of, you know, the dirty thing to be, you know, really interested in hard power and and what realism can tell us about these zones. Um, so that was the first thing. The second, I guess, driving force was there was no forum that really linked the northern polar experts with southern polar experts, which I think is extremely important. And though both Ryan and I are kind of odd in the fact that we cut in terms of our expertise both poles. Um, I like to think of them more as the polar regions and contested commons kind of places. Um, there was very little out there that really linked up in a geographical sense folks that are, are, are located in the different ends of the, the earth. Um, we have different experiences that we can bring to the table, you know, different governance approaches. Um, they're all really quite useful. To, to engage on. Um, another point was we wanted to link academics with military folks. Um, as much as we we see, you know, the rationale for the two camps to be speaking, it doesn't happen enough. Um, and coming from, you know, global oil as well, I think that there was a component there in which I kept reading about the polar regions and I felt like the commercial realities, you know, these these business driving forces that do have a lot to do have a lot of a shaping factor in these regions were left off um, because it didn't fit nicely in either the scholarly or the sort of military policy camps. We also, I think, wanted to break through these assumptions that liberal democratic institutions and the existing treaty mechanisms um, are holding tight and they're kind of infallible. I think that they absolutely, you know, are eroding at the seams. Um, and I, I know for myself, I wanted to jump in and kind of have a chance to, to salvage these institutions or at least point to the bits in which they're weak um, before they completely collapse. Um, and just I guess the final point is in terms of how we kind of came together with this, with this project was the realist lens and this kind of focus tends to be lost in the environmental and the social dialogue of the polar regions. And while these are absolutely concerns, I do think that there's a fundamental realist kind of hard power um, base to these concerns. And, um, you know, if we just look to climate change and what that's doing to military force um, throughout the region, national security is obviously impacted by shifts in strategic competition. Um, so it's kind of it's, it's, an, an, it's a security nexus that kind of feeds 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 into itself um but it's just so fragmented when it comes to the polar regions so we really wanted to kind of close that gap yeah and ryan here this is well stated and, and liz and i have obviously had these kind of conversations with a lot of folks um in various forms over the last uh, several months since launching the project and what liz stated is so perfectly uh framed in the sense that we have generally observed a kind of a, a phenomenon if you will where people just tend to look at the polar regions as these peripheral regions of, and we know about the phrase, you know, we know about the idea of Arctic exceptionalism and a whole bunch of other things, but people have, at least our observations, people have just tended to lump these regions into zones of exceptionalism and, and uh, impervious to strategic competition and, and potential conflict and, and things that Liz and I just looking at the, at the objective realities of the international institutions and, and the fallibility um, as well as the fragility of these things, we just wanted to get a forum that, that, like Liz said, brings both polar regions together within the lens of strategic competition, within the lens of international security and relations, and articulates the issues and, and raises awareness to these, these issues and advocates for even greater awareness that these things are not, by the way, these, these things, I mean institutions and uh, some of the governance mechanisms that are kind of holding the whole thing together, they're not as, as stable as 
I think a lot of people just assume them to be. And so Liz and I have, have referred to this idea of, um, of the, the, the treaties and, and the governance mechanisms just really not being fit for purpose in today's 21st century strategic competition. So we were looking for a forum that, as Liz said, you know, brings everything together, bridges the civil-military divide, uh, but also advances knowledge and tries to, again, raise awareness about these issues and why we need to pay attention to these things, even though they're on the periphery of our, of our minds uh, and very literally on the periphery of our, our vision, we need and we felt that there was a need to bring people together in, a, in an academic form of some kind that also acknowledges and accepts and, and, and grapples with the hard realities of where these things may be going absent engagement. Yeah, we really wanted to come in and, you know, ruffle up the system, right? Um, and in a sense, you know, we have thrown the polar rule book out. We are working in the Arctic and the Antarctic context in one kind of lump. And um, I think there's such a simplistic understanding about the two regions. And, you know, yes, they are. I think the apples and oranges analogy is quite useful, right? It's half true. They're both fruits. They're both round. But then you dig a little deeper and they're, they're fundamentally different. But in their differences, um, in the big picture, we see a lot of similarities, if that makes sense. You know, it, you know, the similarities we've got here, you know, they're polar zones, the climate. It's treacherous to work, live, um, um, operate there. Great powers are engaged there. They're part of national identity narratives. Um, research and science collaboration kind of draws, um, drives people to work in the zones. Um, they both have international law mechanisms applied, but in different ways. And as Ryan pointed out, uh, cooperation is kind of stamped across both of the regions with, you know, 60 years of the Antarctic Treaty System and no conflict so far in the Arctic. Um, but the differences, you know, a, a single layer beneath these similarities are really quite, quite threatening, I think, for, for our state interests in both zones, you know. Sovereignty is not treated the same way in either pole. Um, you know, the, the Antarctic Treaty is often assumed to have kind of frozen that debate. Um, and, and, and yes, it has, but the, uh, just take the Australian point of view, we still, in our national kind of, in our, in our narrative, claim 42%. And that's front and centre of every single kind of Antarctic um, policy we have. But that's not, that doesn't fit with the realities of what the treaty system does, right? Um, and in the Arctic, obviously, we've got a lot of hot air, I guess, with Russia's most recent kind of continental shelf claim. Um, so they're, they're two regions that on, I guess, face value, we've been trained to treat very differently. But I think there's real merit in looking at how they're similar and how great power politics and, you know, uh, strategic competition and the forces at play kind of are shaping the two regions in, in very similar ways. Great. That was a, that was a fantastic start to this. Um, and you've, you've given me a lot of uh, kind of threads that we're, we'll follow here in the Q&A. Uh, before we start going down some of those roads, um, I know that the, uh, I, I don't want to do math in public, but I know the project itself uh, is relatively new. I think it's, it's not even a year old. Uh, feel free to correct me. Um, but kind of going out the gate, um, what were the, the first sort of themes or, that you wanted the project to explore and, and what's sort of been your focus of effort in the first year here that it's been, been in operation? So the project launched in January of this year. So January 21, we had our launch week, that first week, and we focused down on a lot of different things. Anybody's familiar with our various uh, articles? I think we put out a handful of pieces there that first week to just kind of frame the the project and give people a sense of where we were going or where we intend to go with this project. And so Liz and I wrote uh, our first kind of launch piece that uh, really laid down what our vision was. Not vision. I think it's probably the wrong way to describe it. But what we really 
really viewed as being not only the impetus behind the project, but also where we think the polar regions are going. Again, absent some sort of productive engagement from folks like Liz and, and myself and, and scholars and practitioners to come in again and raise awareness about these these various issues. And so what we try to do is, is raise awareness of the fact that uh, we can't continue to stick our heads in the sand and assume the, um, the, the stability of these various mechanisms. So what we try to do early on is, is brief or write about the idea of strategic competition and the fact, again, that it is alive and well in the uh, in, in various capacities and various definitions, but we do see competition in the polar regions. And we need to, again, acknowledge the realities that these things are, as, as we talk about the idea of battle sprays compression, if there's any Marines on the, on the call here or any soldiers, anybody that's familiar with that idea, right? As technology improves, as our ability to access even the farthest regions of the world improves and so forth, these things, these regions, these polar regions are not necessarily beyond the scope of a imagination but be reality these things these regions do have um viable interests that uh, that states are certainly progressing toward and trying to realize and in some is is hyperbolic and overblown we we acknowledge that fact but others are real and others are are actual um resources and and uh, points of interest that will drive again at the very least at the very least activity and if we think about a a cooperation to conflict sort of continuum this is something that again we don't we're not trying to be alarmist we're not trying to inject any sort of uh, of urgency in the sense that these that the polar regions are going to descend into into 21st century conflict at any point in the near future but again we we're trying to raise awareness to the fact that as you have more states descending on or ascending to each of these regions respectively. And as you have more and more activity, it will eventually lead to cooperation. Yes, we see that and we will see and we and we see productive mechanisms of cooperation even between the likes of Russia and the United States uh, uncharacteristically and uniquely in that region relative to other places around the world. So we acknowledge these facts as well, but at the same time we look at the things that that are driving the the approach is driving the activity in these regions and what might they translate into. So this idea of strategic, uh, excuse me, competition that might evolve or that already has in some cases evolved from cooperation. And then what's the next step? What happens from competition? Do we have now confrontation? And then what's the next step from conf confrontation? The logical conclusion is that it could be conflict. And so we started out with that sort of narrative that, uh, again, these, these regions need to generate more discussion than they have to date, and strategic competition is accelerating. And if anybody, again, is familiar with that, that, that launch piece, we basically hashed out those, those primary points. And then we went down and we discussed the idea of, of polar security futures in a manner of speaking and what, what these regions may well look like, again, absent some sort of uh, productive dialogue or, or advanced dialogue beyond where we are now. And and we are trying to use this platform, this platform by way of the project, as a way to, again, advance this dialogue and solicit contributions from others around the, around the, the world, literally, because Liz and I well, full, well, or know full well that there are a lot of folks out there with, A, an interest, but, B, something valuable to say about these regions, whether it be folks that have deployed there uh, for various training exercises or folks who are engaged from, by way of scholarship. There's a lot of folks out there that, that will have valuable insight and perspectives that will advance this dialogue and will do so productively. So we wanted a platform, again, that would provide the voice to the collective scholarly and practitioner body, again, to, be, to bridge that, that civil military nexus and, and really provide a, a way to advance the discussion. So um, I'll turn it back over to Liz. I'm sure she's chomping at the bit to respond to the things I said. So Ryan, over. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I just really wanted to pick up on that last kind of point you were making. Um, we 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 have the challenge first and foremost of sort of polar camps, right? You've got the academics, the military folks, uh, policymakers, the environmentalists, and they don't talk to each other. So we wanted to bridge that, but then we have this kind of kind of odd um, reality in which. DC centric think tanks, Brussels centric think tanks, um, who work on Arctic or Antarctic uh, matters, don't don't do enough of the kind of outreach they should be doing 
to build kind of a collective mass and to really get the litany of, as Ryan was pointing out, the litany of ideas, but also expertise, people that have actually worked and operated in these regions, they aren't doing enough to bring them all into the conversation. Um, and with that, if we get more of the contestation of ideas, but also, you know, adequate realities of what it's like to be down in, in these regions, um, we don't have, I guess, as robust of a of a discussion as we should have, right? So I also felt that coming into this project in terms of why we needed it, you know, realism as a scholar, realism is always kind of shot across the bow for not having enough predictability power, right? You know, how did it miss the collapse of the Soviet Union is often kind of a, ch a charge leveled at, at the field. But I actually think realism has a lot to say and has a lot of explanatory power when it comes to the polar regions. And that's something that I'm personally quite interested in at the moment. I'm looking at, you know, the key indications of what emerging states like China and India specifically is often left off this dialogue in polar regions. Uh, resurgent Russia, you know, plan to do in the polar regions. Um, their strategies actually cross both ends of the earth. There's quite a lot of continuity there. Um, it's not reactive um, and it's certainly nothing new, you know, great power interest in, e in either zone. So for China, I think, you know, this this push as a, as a great polar power, which not only legitimises its Arctic role in what it calls the commons, um, it really kind of entrenches its position in the South Pole as well. For Russia, we have this kind of historical um, Antarctic endeavour, that's part of a narrative you'll hear earlier this year that they, you know, celebrated 200 years of discovering the continent. Um, and obviously in the Arctic, we've got that kind of Stalin heroism as well. So it's interesting to see how uh, great powers, emerging powers, states are using this kind of PR agenda to cultivate um, their polar interests, but it also legitimises their engagement in the regions, and that makes it harder to then kick them out, right? Um, so I think what we're already finding, and where, as Ryan said, you know, a few months into this project, is it's getting harder to actually see how the West, broadly, broadly speaking, can curtail or stunt the polar footprints of states like China and Russia. We've kind of we've kind of missed the window there. Um, what I'm wanting to kind of look at for the rest of the year and really take this project um, into this kind of question of the hybrid nature of polar strategies in both in both regions. You know, why uh, Ryan speaks so eloquently of that kind of competition, strategic competition continuum. And I don't think we do enough of that in the field. We talk rather about peacetime, wartime, or is it conflict or cooperation? But we can have elements of conflict and cooperation coexisting, you know, in the same day, in the same policy. Um, but I think what we're trying to do with this project is ask these questions. Well, okay, how is cooperation going to be co-opted to coercion? We're already seeing what China's doing in that kind of geoeconomic space um, in most of the Arctic Scandinavian area. Australian Antarctic uh, research and science is is underwritten by the Chinese government, you know. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave that question there. Plenty to talk about. And I, I'll, as Ryan here, I'll follow up on, on what Liz said here. And one of the things just from a U.S. centric perspective that we are actively looking for at the project are some papers, some articles, some ideas on on the U.S. military role in the polar regions. And obviously we know that by way of the products that have come out recently that the Navy, the Air Force, the Army in particular all have their respective Arctic strategies that they've released within really about the last 12 months, the, uh, the Navy and the Army within the last uh, four or five months. Um, but what we, what I've noticed anyway, putting my U.S. military hat on here, obviously being associated with the uh, U.S. military uh, PME system, is uh, there's a 
a lot of a lot of big words in these strategies, but there's not a lot of meat in terms of how they're actually going to be operationalized. And so we look at things like the Navy talking about maintaining enhanced presence in the Arctic region, okay, short of a handful of carrier strike groups that have sailed up but just, uh, just north of 66 degrees latitude and gotten battered in the North Atlantic. What kind of enhanced presence, at least on the surface, does the Navy really have to, to maintain, right? And then what kind of capabilities beyond that do they have to, to meet that line of effort? Uh, and you can go through examples of some of the other ones, like the Army, um, the Army Arctic strategy in particular just makes me scratch my head when it talks about regaining Arctic dominance. And I think everybody who studies the Arctic and has a history of, of the Arctic, at least through an international security lens, we're, we're asking ourselves, well, regain what? Regain dominance of what? You never had it. And then on top of that, it's a land force that, that wants to operate and, and gain dominance, supposedly by the way of its title of its uh, strategy, in a domain that's owned, that's, that's 30 percent uh, ground territory, right? And so, and, and 10, of, 10 to 15 percent of that ground territory is, is owned by Russia. So th- there's a lot of these, these curious statements in, 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 that are just riddled throughout these strategies strategies that I myself, from a U.S. military perspective, would love to see some contributions on from our collective audience um, and our collective readership to, to really kind of give us some ideas as to how do we do all of the things that are listed in these strategies, and how do we succeed in these regions given the limitations, given the the, uh, the restrictions, and, uh, and and operate really within a within reality rather than you know hopeful uh, hopeful coa. So there's just a lot of stuff that we have. We're super Super ambitious, and, and obviously you can you can hear in our voices the passion that, uh, that we have for the, these these topics. So we've got a lot of things we want to cover, and we could spend the entire night literally talking about all the different things that we'd like to to see and, and read and, and engage with. But uh, for now, I will shut up and turn it back to you, Ian. Over. If yeah, I could great. just jump in, I'm oh, going to sure. nerd out on top of Ryan's um, points just then. Absolutely, right? I was scratching my head reading these strategies as well because I couldn't believe, you know, how how deep in, like, I guess the, the policymaking system in the US specifically with the Arctic, right, the belief and the assumption that the systems and the treaty and the international governance models, UNCLOS, <laughs> um, are are robust and i think that they are a fragile base to build any sort of strategy small s um because they're not holding into perpetuity there's work to do to make sure that this this system um can actually continue to host strategic competition in the polar regions um and i guess coming back a step from that as Ryan kind of pointed out rightly, yeah, you know, how do you deliver? How do you achieve what you've set out to achieve? Sure, but the other question is, I didn't see the real encapsulation of national interests in the polar regions. That hasn't been, um, that hasn't come out yet. And I think it, it should be kind of figured out before steps B and C. Yeah, well said. Yeah, well, I'll uh, I'll back both of you up and and say to everyone in the audience, and we'll reiterate that when we put this up on our various uh, audio and video feeds. You know, get people to to contribute on the military side to the project and and try and flesh out some of those big words and hang some meaning on them. So um, I'll throw one more question your way myself, and I want to turn it over to our audience um, to make sure we got time for them to engage with you, but. Um, I noted in both you were sort of talking about the the realism perspective of, uh, you know, sort of the, the the dam is breaking a little bit in terms of the older liberal democratic and, and treaty and and formal alliance structures that we've counted on are starting to erode. Um, and so I was wondering if you could maybe uh, both expand on like what are what are the what are the disadvantages now or what are what are the shortfalls of those older systems today? Um, what, what are the challenges that are really stressing them right now? And what kind of framework do you think would be needed to replace those if we're to effectively do, you know, we talked about the cooperation and the, the co-opting and the coercion to, um, you know, to kind of to, to, to keep nefarious influence from getting up there in a way that it's starting to now? I'm happy to yeah, jump absolutely. in unless you want to take it. Go ahead. 
yeah i'll jump in quickly um absolutely i think there's two things at play here the first is we have strategically got lazy because there is a sense that the system the international you know um cooperation that has been ongoing and featured in both polar regions um, for at least you know the last 50 years is enough to kind of um, help us sleep easy there's nothing that could happen that could upset that that kind of that balance um, so we got lazy there in the assumptions that these systems will hold tight they can't be eroded the second issue is that um, obviously with middle east kicking off after 9 11 the focus um for the us specifically was not on the polar regions we had this ability and this is an australian interest as uh, issue as well right and i think it's a liberal democratic uh western however you want to brand us writ large issue of we don't have the ability to pivot to a number of fronts in a strategic kind of outlook and second of all, we don't have the ability to think of foreign policy and strategic affairs in the kind of decadal, the long term way in which states like Russia and China do. You know, um, so we took our eye off the prize, you might say, in both regions. Um, I'll speak really briefly about Antarctica. So the treaty itself, you know, crafted in the 50s, um, the conception of military threats, Back then, we were talking just about nuclear annihilation. We didn't think about we didn't you know think about cyber. We didn't think about geoeconomic erosion. Um, climate change wasn't something that was considered there. So the terms, and I, I really do urge anyone that's interested in polar cooperation to look at the treaty and read it. You know, understand that it is a flexible you know, rather, rather malleable um, set of agreements in the Antarctica. So what has happened is we've seen a proliferation of dual use technologies, things that are, it is a region that is kind of held, um, put on the shelf for peaceful scientific research and international collaboration. Awesome. But you can brand science on anything. And China's very good at this. We've got the Beidou, um, satellite network that is for science purposes but we know that there is dual use military applications of this network um, while you are unable to militarize the continent of antarctica you can have military personnel and hardware <laughs> on the continent if it is in support of scientific and research endeavors so there's that component of the kind of the 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 um treaty itself but then there's also the issue that there is no real enforcement mechanism um there's no ability to call out states that are eroding the edges of the treaty because it's a consensus-based operation um so in many ways, I kind of scratch my head when I think about Antarctica. And I, I'm actually surprised that we haven't had a state opt out of the treaty mechanism as yet. Um, and I'm increasingly kind of perplexed that we aren't having these conversations of plan B, what next? We are, we are in, extremely lucky that states like China specifically uh, and Russia have at least on face value continued to support um, the treaty mechanism itself. Lucky. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, that often happens when Liz and I are on the same forum. She usually does, says whatever I wanted to say, but says it 10 times better. Um, so it's an honor to work with her. But uh, to extend on, on some of these points, so Ian, you asked about the realism threat and the lens of, of realism and why we are taking this particular framework or this particular approach toward the polar regions. And then Liz laid it out in the beginning of the conversation. But when you come and think about it, I mean, we need to, I think, 
think in order to operate a and have a, a productive and substantive discussion, we need to have a consensus on what realism really is, right? So in the IR world, realism has three pillars. And when you really, I mean, I'm just, I'm going to simplify this, and I understand if there's an IR professor on the line, probably he or she's probably scratching her head, his or her head, saying, oh, there's more to it than that, there's more nuance. I, yeah, I, I got it, but you know, for, the, for the purpose of the discussion, right, realism is about three things. It's about anarchy, right, in the international system. It's about sovereignty, and it's about power, right? And, and those three things are intertwined. And so when you think about those three things, anarchy, sovereignty, and power, and then you, you transpose them over the polar regions, then we look at all the other issues that could potentially present themselves that might be of concern to Western states like Australia and the United States, right? And we need to think about how these particular states and their respective governments might orient themselves to the challenges of the polar region should they present that way in the future, which there, there's certainly some indications that they might lead that way. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So we know from the Treaty of Westphalia to all the way through into World War II or, or the preceding uh, World War II, right, and then, and then some, some element of World War II, right, states have been fighting over territory and land for, for hundreds of years, right, if not even longer than that, beyond the historical record. So we know that states have been fighting over land and they've been fighting over territory. And we know that th this idea of this unresolved sovereignty, especially on Antarctica, um, as well as some of the, uh, the competing claims up in the Arctic, we know that these, these issues present themselves in the modern day. And so to look at these regions and say, well, they're going to remain exceptional, even though there are, they are contested commons and even though there are competing claims, and even though there are unrecognized claims and so forth, again, to continue to think about the fact that the, that the world is going to somehow, through an international mechanism, maintain its stability, it, we hope it does. We certainly hope it does. But again, just to assume that it will, absent action, is naive, and it's just the reality of it, and that's the way we come at it. So we need to think about the, the stability of these mechanisms and what is actually presiding over these things and, and keeping this consensus-based approach to activity and, and a variety of other uh, things in these regions, keeping them stable in a manner of speaking. And then you think about, again, and Liz has already uh, laid this out, but the fragility of the international institutions, the covenants, the contracts that that kind of preside, again, over the, the order, if you will. We hear a lot about, uh, you know, world order and, and uh, so forth, and, and we can get into an entirely different discussion on whether or not there really is a world order and, or a rules-based order and so forth. But that kind of comes back to this idea of of, of anarchy, right? A realist, at least fundamentally and, and from an elementary perspective, realists believe that the world is inherently anarchic, right? And so we, we are taking this lens and applying it again to particular regions of, um, of concern, of interest, and thinking about what might, based on those prescriptions, what might be the future of these regions, again, absent particular activities and, and discussions and dialogue. And so the, I think the last piece to kind of wrap up my rambling on this, to answer the realist piece, is that the United States, at least and I can speak from our perspective here, uh, the United States has pretty much objectively, since the end of World War II, 1945, we've applied this this idea of liberal hegemony, right? We'd be everywhere all the time, you know, influence the world uh, through presence and through engagement and a variety of other other means and mechanisms, be it military, militarily, diplomatic, economically, you name it. And that has been the the guiding the guiding framework of the United States foreign policy for really the better part of the last 75 to 80 years. And that's, that's an objective fact, right? What then, what then becomes of a policy if we decide to change? And maybe are there merits to abandoning maybe this idea of liberal hegemony where we're everywhere all the time and, and looking at the merits of a competing philosophy, this one being, in this case, realism and then all its substrands and, and uh, informative theories. So we're trying to, again, bring awareness to the fact that there might be just possibly, right, there might be a different way to look at these things. There might be a different way to engage with the, the conversation and, and really just try to promote a dialogue, promote a dialogue as to how, how and why and, and in what ways we can best advance toward, um, you know, this idea of this utopian idea, right, of, uh, of stable polar regions free of, uh, of comp or excuse me, free of conflict. Because I think competition ultimately is good, right, but we certainly don't want to see it devolve into conflict. And, and absent, again, some of these, these things we've been talking about, it, it, it does have the potential to, to get to that point. And then the question 
question ultimately becomes, and it's rhetorical, I'll, I won't answer it, right? But it's for us to think about what then are the, at least from the U.S. perspective, what are our interests? When I say ours, the United States, what are our interests, as Liz alluded to earlier, in the polar regions? How do we define those? For the Arctic, it's probably it's probably a homeland defense issue, principally first and foremost. For Antarctica, it becomes a little more complicated because we're more interested in, in states getting to Antarctica and being able to project power from Antarctica, not projecting power to the southern continent. So we also need to understand that dynamic as well and, and think about, again, the, the evolution of the space domain and, and how important the polar regions are going to be for space power projection and a variety of other things that, again, I'll, um, I'll stop running my suck on and we can probably get to maybe with the Q&A. So, over. Can I just follow on from that, Ann? Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Um, I think in many ways, Project 6633 is kind of an AA group for realists, right? We we hide away because we're tarred with this kind of brush of warmongers. But I mean, that's so disingenuous. Um, we're here and this is, you know, we're proud about the project and we want to be asking the questions, you know, what is the tipping point for these liberal institutions? What is the tipping point for these agreements? When does Arctic and Antarctic exceptionalism, you know, fail? There's no use dealing with it once it's happened. Um, I think, as I spoke earlier about realism often, you know, being leveled at not having predictability power, I think we've we've certainly got it and we've got some test scenarios that we should really be using. Um, and just a quick point before we jump into questions, I think something we've missed for quite a while in the field by way of dialogue, which I'm hoping the project can kind of enhance, is this idea that the polar regions, well, reality rather, the polar regions don't play by Western strategic cultural theory, right? Um, we assume that they do, but power, when we talk about power, we're talking about control. When we're talking about authority, we're talking about influence. You know, it's kind of topsy-turvy when we think about these concepts of strategic cultures in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So in the Arctic, Russia has the power via basic geography, right? Ergo, legitimate control. The US, as Ryan spoke about, you know, has this kind of global policeman kind of um, unipolar leadership ideals. And perhaps, you know, that has served its purposes in, in time gone past, but it doesn't have the same level of power by way of basic geography in the Arctic context. And by failing to, to, to ratify UNCLOS and to, you know, come to the table throughout, well, at least the last two administrations in Arctic affairs, you know, its authority has waned because its influence isn't there. Um, and then we can talk about, you know, China investing in enhancing its influence in the Arctic, which then feeds back into its own authority, whether that's, you know, for domestic propaganda purposes, it kind of, it kind of doesn't matter. The fact is that they're, they're there and they're entrenched. And I, I don't actually know how you kick the Chinese out of the Arctic now. Um, and I guess I'll just finish off one, on one really quick point. Something that is coming out um, in most of the kind of op-eds and even sadly government strategy with most of the polar regions is we have this assumption that Chinese strategic culture is just like Western strategic culture or Russian strategic culture. And I think we need to do better. We need to understand um, who we're dealing with, how they think, because that will shape their behaviour, right? And our suite of options available to, yes, compete for our national interests. Um, the West-centric model of competition, I would say, is to beat the other. For the Chinese, and I cannot sort of um, articulate this enough, for the Chinese, it's not about beating, it's about competing. And I think if we kind of accept that those differences and divergences in strategic cultures are playing out in the polar regions, I think that's where we need to be crafting, you know, competitive strategy from that point. We're not speaking the same language. Great, thank you very much for both of you. Um, and I'll re re uh, reiterate to the audience, if you have a question, just go ahead and throw it in the chat so I can I can take a look at it. And um, okay, we've got one 
Good, because I had uh, I have a bunch of other things to go over, but I want to give everyone a chance. So, uh, Brian Cole, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, great. I'm kind of remote. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's loud and clear. Okay, great. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Ian and, and Dr. Buchanan and Burke for uh, for putting this all together. And the 6633 project is uh, awesome. I've been uh, trying to keep up with it. But I'd like if you might be able to expand just a little more uh, on the key differences or similarities between the two polar regions when it comes to international politics and uh, security issues. And I find it interesting that the project is is examining both poles. Uh, I've read some of Anne-Marie Brady's uh, research that she's done on China's efforts in both poles, but in the larger picture, just wonder if you might be able to expand on that a little more. Sir, Liz, do you wanna take this or I, I can run it too? Um, it's a great question, sir. And one of the things that we are, are really, to be completely blunt, transparent with, uh, that is one of the, the principal issues that we are contending with at the project. If you notice on our submissions page, we, we say that we will give preference by way of publication to any of the pieces that, that address or engage with both polar regions uh, writ large in the, in the theme of the argument and the theme of the analysis. And, and frankly, again, in the, in the initial submissions that we've gotten, uh, they really haven't. And I think that that's, that's indicative of kind of how the broader community of scholars and practitioners really views these things, but also why, as Liz pointed out in the beginning of this conversation, why we are doing what we are doing, because there are no existing forums, again, focused on defense and security, uh, again, broadly defined, that, that really loop or, excuse me, link both polar regions together by way of, as Liz referred to, right, the, uh, the fruit comparison. And it's an apples and oranges. Yep, check, Roger, got it. But they're both fruit. Uh, so we we have been dealing with this, and, and uh, I know it's not much of a substantive answer, but it, it's uh, it kind of drives at the point that this is something that's that's a challenge for us to deconflict uh, because they are so different in so many ways, but they are so similar in so many ways. And, and really, again, what it comes down to, as I alluded to before, uh, by way of the international politics discourse, and as you ask, is we look at the issues of, and I, I write about this in my book, and uh, Liz is written some about these things as well. But we look at the commonalities, right? We look at the commonalities. If they are both fruit, it's an apple and an orange, but they are fruit. Well, what kind of, you know, it's round, right, as Liz said. And, and what other commonalities are there? And so we look at the fact that they are, in many ways, considered contested commons, right? The Antarctica and the high seas, they are both considered part of the international commons, right? This, these global commons, zones of access that all for all to access and transit and benefit from, right? The polar regions are both commons, and there is evidence or there's there's expanding contestation. Uh, certainly, we know co cooperation, we know competition, and there's expanding evidence of possibly even being contested. Um, the fact that there are competing claims, they, there's similarities in, in both regions and the fact that there are competing territorial claims, or at least uh, where the, the continental shelves, the boundary lines extend to, and or where they don't, right? So there are, it's commons, claims, right? And then as I refer to uh, in my book, it's the covenants, it's the international contracts, the treaty systems, the governance mechanisms that are, again, as we've said, not fit for purpose, or maybe they aren't fit for purpose, or maybe they won't be, maybe they are now, but what will the challenges to them be later? Uh, and then the last thing, we, we have to look at the, the reality of, of, again, space. As I mentioned uh, previously, there, there is some, uh, some attraction for a variety of states. We see in particular with uh, Russia and China down in Antarctica, they're, they're specifically interested in, in trying to use the, uh, the clarity of the skies, the Antarctic skies, to advance their space power projection, uh, use their um, GLONASS and Beidou uh, GPS, or excuse me, GPS analogs that we have, right? They are trying to use the, the advantages of these regions uh, for for space power projection, right? And they'll couch it as a as a commercial use and, and so forth. But there's a lot of dual use things. If you are familiar with Anne Marie Brady's work, uh, then this is not this is not a revelation to you, as she documents well in the, both in her book and various writings. So there are some common common threads there, right, between 
both regions that we really are trying to engage with that we would like to see more contributions kind of try to engage with this broader community of scholars and practitioners looking at what's similar to these regions rather than again just simply focusing on I shouldn't say simply it's a, it's a bad um, it's a bad modifier but rather than focusing exclusively on one region or the other we would like to see more dialogue looking at both over Liz over to you yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, sad question. It's such a complex one, though, as well. Um, I think people tend to shy away from doing a compare and contrast exercise with the two polar regions because of the assumptions that exist about how they are different and similar, right? I don't think we can clearly um, separate the two because for every difference that the two have, within that difference they've got similar undercurrents so i'll give a couple of examples because i know that was completely not helpful um so first and foremost they're both kind of treated as this exceptionalist kind of um, sector of the world either end that is siloed from conflict but we need to dig deeper into that how are we defining conflict boots on the ground warheads or are we looking at um, predatory economics, um, geoeconomic efforts to buy up critical infrastructure in the regions, to underrate scientific endeavours in the regions. Um, other similarities, as Ryan has pointed out, is you know they both are home to resources. Um, so there's the kind of realist interests there at play. Um, great powers are engaged in both ends of the earth as well as emerging powers. Again, this kind of Indian piece of the puzzle is always left off, but I think it's to our detriment if we um, continue to overlook India's interest in the polar regions, even the third pole, right, um, Himalayas. And then they are similar in terms of the broad governance mechanisms, which are consensus-based. But it's not enough anymore to just say, you know, you know states all come together um, in the forums and utilise this for a platform for dialogue. Um, but the point is consensus is easily frustrated and we know that the Chinese and the Russians are great at doing it. And you cannot level a claim at either of them saying that they are, you know, undermining the effectiveness or the efficiency of the systems in place because that is the very heart of what a consensus body is. Um, if not everyone agrees, then nothing progresses. That, in terms of another similarity, is increasingly being weaponized, I think, um, against Western interests in the Arctic um, and the Antarctic. The differences are probably more interesting for, for my personal kind of research interest. Um, sovereignty is a fun one. So it's more or less sorted in the Arctic, right? Um, continental powers have used international law to, you know, we, we, know, we know the claims there, whether you want to say they're all kind of clear cut sectoral claims, but we know the rules of rules of the road there. In the Antarctic, there is this assumption that the treaty has frozen claims. It did not freeze claims, okay? And this is a problem that Australian policymakers have as well, right, with the 42% claim. It did not freeze claims. What it did was it shelved the discussion of sovereignty altogether, right? So it's a free-for-all if you sign up to the treaty to do what you want to do so long as it has a research um, and science kind of peaceful agenda. Again, how are we um, defining those terms? They're certainly not in the same way that they were defined today of the 50s um, when the treaty was crafted. But the difference clearly is that we haven't dealt with sovereignty. So it is an unclaimed continent. And if you flip the map up, the world map upside down, that is the continent that has the strategic reach into all key oceans, ocean basins. Um, so that is, you know, just a, that's a prize waiting, right? Um, another difference is the Arctic is kind of viewed as this evolving, um, evolving by the minute current geopolitical kind of hotbed, right? Um, for better or worse, that's what it, that's how it's painted. Um, Antarctica is more or less frozen. That's for cooperation, um, which I think completely misses how cooperation is being co-opted for coercion um, and kind of insidious 
um, long-term strategic agendas, specifically from Beijing. Um, another kind of final difference that I think is, is really important to flesh out is that the mechanisms and the traditional levers of strategic competition play out differently in the two zones. Now, let's just use one specific example, uh, alliances. So very clear cut in the Arctic, you've got um, whether it's the US or, you know, Norway, um, you know, speaking about the North Atlantic allies or its Arctic allies and partners in terms of dealing with the issues up there, that's very clear cut. We know what side you're on, who's red team, you know, who's blue team. Um, in Antarctica, though, we don't have this. Everyone's more or less on the same playing field. But what is really interesting is um, traditional alliances, specifically the ANSYS alliance, so the Australia-US alliance, is a difficult one to navigate in Antarctica because, and we've just got to the point now, it's a big white elephant, we just don't talk about it, but the US does not acknowledge our claim to Antarctica, does not acknowledge the Australian Antarctic Territory. Um, and it's a project I'm working on for the State Department right now, looking at how post-treaty sort of, um, a run on Antarctica, what does the ANSYS Alliance do, right? We know strategically the US has planted its flag at the South, the geographical South Pole. Um, and in the last 24 months, we have seen here in Canberra, um, the ability for our best mate, our long-term ally, <laughs> Washington, um, to allow Chinese expansion in the Australian Antarctic Territory, four of their five bases, fifth is underway, um, at the moment are in our region and we are starting to feel um, kind of left out in the cold there so that's another one to kind of watch great thank you both of those were that was uh that was a lot to unpack there um i got we have another question in the chat and i apologize in advance i'm probably going to mispronounce your name but we'll do that question and then i'll have one more for both of you and then i think uh We'll, we'll call it good uh, to respect for everyone's time. So for uh, Jorn Quiller, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, that was uh, that was close enough. Um, uh, I'm a Norwegian uh, military faculty advisor here at Command and Staff College. Uh, and in, in that regard, um, I'm interested in, in your thoughts about the Arctic Council and, and how a realist regards that construct, uh, um, and also um, uh, that Russia is now taking over the secretariat uh, in a week's time. If you can uh, comment on the usefulness of the Ar Arctic Council and if there should be something similar for the Antarctica, uh, over. This one has you written all over it with your article with Troy from uh, last week. But yeah, and then I'll I'll let you pick up some Antarctic points there about how um that's governed. Um, yeah, great question. So I think for the realist, I mean, we probably have some kind of poster somewhere that says we're just warmongers um and kind of bang our heads with our hands, obviously. But um, I think the Arctic Council is a significant component of Arctic diplomacy, but it is not the be all and end all. And that's the case for any kind of any part of the world, right? In any sector, it has to have various elements. Um, I think the discussions, it's great to hear that there will be an in-person meeting. I think that kind of COVID diplomacy that's moved so many of these discussions, specifically the Antarctic um, consultative treaty meeting, moving those online has had, it, it's had a real net loss effect, I think, for traditional diplomacy, for the kind of hallways and sidelines meetings that are really important to kind of grease the wheels to get states talking. So first and foremost, it's great that it can happen in person for the up upcoming Arctic Council meeting. Um, for the realist, obviously dialogue is important, but it is coupled by that deterrence aspect. Um, I don't think we can have one without the other. Um, going back to the kind of NATO old school Harmel doctrine, right? Um, that's how you need to deal with Russia, I think. And post sanctions, post 2014, this approach broadly to drop off the dialogue component because it was seen to be kind of seeding or pandering. I think that was short-sighted. Um, you can't have one without the other. In terms of the um, 
plan, I guess, for the Russian chairmanship of the Arctic Council. I think we've they've been quite open um, in terms of what they plan to do, and it's nothing surprising. It's all the sort of the softer things, and we know that the Arctic Council can't have that military security discussion anyway. It's not mandated to. So the question then becomes, is this enough? And I think we're all kind of leaning to the reality that it's no, it's not enough. We need to have another forum, but that doesn't mean, um, I don't think we should change the mandate of the Arctic Council. I think it serves its purpose, it's needed. Um, I do think that there needs to be another forum that is crafted, um, which allows for military strategic issues to be aired, or at least, um, stakeholders of Arctic Rim countries can be engaging um, in how they plan to deal with Chinese military incursion into the Arctic Ocean, because I think that's the key thing. Um, and without that dialogue, we will continue to have these kind of popular assumptions that Russia is welcoming, rolling out the welcome map for China into the Arctic. That is not the case. There is no access. There is no partnership there. Um, they're just as fearful of Chinese expansion into the Arctic as the US is. Um, so, yeah, we need to have the forum, I think, crafted for the dialogue. Whether that will be delivered in the next two years, I don't know. I think it will certainly be tabled and pushed. Um, but that's another kind of problem with the Arctic Council. I think we give it, we put so much pressure on what it can and can't do um, that you don't want it to crumble. And as I said, dialogue is as important as deterrence in the defence kind of discussion with the polar regions. Yeah, Ryan here. So it's uh, it's a great question and to put a little bit of, of U.S. flavor on it and what we view and, and Liz pretty much nailed all the, the main points. Uh, from a, a military standpoint, the, the United States certainly hopes, right, and as if there's Marines on the line, right, we know hope is not a course of action, right, but we know that the United States at the very least hopes that the, the Arctic Council will be a sufficient mechanism to maintain some semblance of, of cooperation in which we are seeing. It is working. It is functioning or is functioning excuse me as a uh, as an efficient cooperation mechanism as Liz laid out but again we're, we're looking at the evolving dynamics and and what might be the future policies the postures if you will of um, of self-interested states and and we've got to contend with those realities and so what the United States is doing what you're seeing a lot of by way of its Arctic policies is, at least from a military standpoint is it's it's um, a lot of fluff as I alluded to before about about getting up to the Arctic, projecting power across the Arctic, I think is one of the Army LOEs, which again is one of those head scratchers that, you know, when we can get to Canada and uh, and Alaska and even Canada, uh, the majority of that, uh, I don't mean to chuckle at it, but it's just, it just kind of points to the absurdities of some of these statements. The majority of that uh, the territory up in uh, in the Canadian Arctic is, is territory that we're not going to access for a variety of reasons, not the least of which um, are native populations to, uh, to those regions. So we, we even have the same dynamic on the uh, on elements of the northern slope in Alaska. So um, there's just a lot of these things that the United States certainly is hopeful that uh, the, the Arctic Council will maintain its its functional uh, purpose. But again, as Liz has written on uh, multiple times with one of our colleagues, Troy, over at the University of Alaska. Uh, you know, we don't have a sufficient Arctic security forum, or excuse me, maybe not a sufficient one, but we don't have a functioning one in the sense that uh, it is it is enough to to have productive dialogue. And again, if we continue to exclude Russia, then what, we're leaving ourselves open to, uh, to to miscalculations, potentially misunderstandings, certainly, uh, and and possibly escalation as a result. So that those are the kind of things that we'd like to avoid. By way of the Ar uh, Antarctica and the U.S. position, obviously, maybe. Not not obviously, but for those who are, are students of, of history in this respect, we know the, the significance that the United States had in, in creating what was uh, the beginning stages of the Antarctic Treaty back in 1959. We know that it was signed in Washington. We know all these things. The United States has taken a leadership position in this treaty system uh, over the years and has obviously vested interest in maintaining it and, and there is in, in maintaining its provisions and, uh, and seeing the continent maintain its status as a continent of of peace. If we look at the Antarctic Treaty and, and the system that it is today, this really was and still is, it was a, a nuclear, excuse me, a uh, arms 
treaty in a sense. It was a, a demilitarization treaty, for lack of a better way to describe it, early on. It was one of the first successful uh, of such international agreements that, uh, that we now have seen many of since. So we have to acknowledge that, but I think at the same time, there's some concern that there, while the treaty may may remain in its various provisions and, and the restrictions that we've we've kind of gone over at least at this point, while those things may remain in place, and there's a lot of discussion as to what's going to be the future of it, in, in uh, we move forward, there's a lot of ambiguity, as Liz already mentioned, about what might states do with self-interest. And, and right now, we're not seeing evidence of strategic competition, at least not uh, not the same way that we are in the Arctic, but we're certainly hearing narrative, or hearing narrative of progression. So from a realist standpoint, what does the United States do about Antarctica, given that it is so far away? And it seems to be contradictory to this idea of sovereignty, because there is no threat to U.S. sovereignty on Antarctica. Um, but the question becomes, okay, if we don't and other states go down to that, uh, that particular region of the world and they start deviating or creatively interpreting uh, various provisions and they start deviating in some ways from various elements of the treaty, right, exploit, as we've said in, in a couple of our papers, as Liz and I have discussed, the, the, the kind of the gray zones of this treaty, right, what then happens? And Liz mentioned this before. What are the tipping points? Right, if, if they're trying to poke, being China, right, if they're trying to poke at the weaknesses of the treaty uh, without without overtly uh, deviating or departing from it, well, what then is the United States response? Should there even be a United States response? And these are questions that, again, we don't have the answers to, but we are looking for dialogue. We're trying to compel some some conversation toward these ends to, to talk about what might be the plan if, in the event, there is a post-ATS world. What might be the plan? What might be the great powers? or at least the Western state position on a, on a continent that has, again, as I, re I referred to before, that Anne-Marie Brady talks or, or calls unresolved sovereignty, right? What might be the plans and what should we do and why? What are our interests? There are a lot of questions here, right? A lot of things that we need to try to reconcile, but at least maybe not reconcile, but at least have dialogue um, relative to and and uh, advance the conversation. So there's, uh, there's some really fascinating stuff for us, and we're trying again to to encourage anybody who's got the same interests, that shares the same passions, to engage in the dialogue and, and uh, come chat with us. Over. Thanks, Ryan. Absolutely. So just reiterating, I think that we can have, I guess, a closing kind of point here for the project is, is we are calling for anyone listening, anyone interested in these in these issues to answer these kinds of questions. And perhaps, I guess, Ryan, we've got a, a, a point to write on now um, or perhaps ask for some submissions, but of this question, you know, how do we give teeth to consensus governance bodies or institutions in the polar zones? How do we do that? Um, I'll leave it up to you to answer. Great. Thank you, very, uh, thank you again for the question and thank you uh, both Dr. Buchanan and Dr. Burke for your responses here. Um, so I think looking at the clock, I think you're, uh, um, we will make that kind of the final point. And uh, I'll be honest, I, I got I got like scribblings on both sides of my paper here. I got like a, a ton more things to talk about and it's making me think that we might just need to get you back both on from your project for another session to go through some more of this stuff uh, because I, th there's a tremendous amount of ground to cover and and I think it's uh, it, it you know you, I think you were sort of intimated where the the, the West and, and the U S uh, particular are are behind the curve on this so we should be talking about it more and shining more lights on it so we will do that um, so I'll, I'll I'll let you both if you have any uh, any final. Uh, questions or any final projects you're working on you want to let us know or or just do another request for contributions i'll uh, give you a couple last words here I'll, I'll jump in first here uh, ian thank you again for coordinating this and, and putting this on we obviously we know we've been uh, a little bit uh, late from our original conversations which i think started months ago but uh, we're, we're thrilled to have this opportunity and have this this forum to share not only our project, but our passions, right? And our interest in, and really solicit some contributions, solicit dialogue and solicit some, um, some evolving conversation. Because again, we are, we're passionate about trying to raise awareness and advocate
appreciate for these these conversations and, and discourse. So, uh, again, appreciate the time, appreciate the uh, the effort in coordinating this, and we appreciate everybody's attention. Obviously, we know it's it's late uh, on the East Coast there, and uh, and Liz, it's early ish in the ish in the morning. Um, I don't have any any final points other than to say, please join us, join us in the conversation, join us in the dialogue, and please send your submissions in to us. We we look forward to reading them. Uh, we are working through a backlog of submissions right now. We've been fortunate to have uh, several who, that came in uh, really at one time, and so we're working through a, a cluster of these uh, by way of editing and a handful of other things that we're trying to do to get them launched. Uh, but we are excited, and uh, just by way of the first few submissions that we've had and some of the podcasts that we've done and some of the, the public engagements, we're excited about where this is going, at least in the early phases. And um, we welcome you along to you know kind of join us in this conversation and, and contribute uh, where and uh, when you feel uh, able and uh, and compelled to do so. So again, uh, thank you for everybody uh, their time and attention. This is uh, Ryan from uh, from USAFA in Colorado. Over and out, Liz. Over to you. Just reiterating, you know, polar geopolitics isn't static; um, it's constantly evolving. And I think we've got caught up in the assumptions that that either both and on their own, I guess. Um, both zones are kind of fixed and sorted. So it's really just a call that, you know, we want submissions, we want you to, anyone really, to engage in these in these kind of security questions about the polar regions. There's no wrong or right answer to any question that we pose in these regions. And I guess just reiterating the fact that the dialogue doesn't belong to academia and it doesn't belong to Washington think tanks. It belongs to those that are cutting the ice it belongs to those that, you know, that are on the ground, the people that are crafting policy um, in basements somewhere. You know, it belongs to all of us and it really will make the end result much richer. Great. Thank you both. And uh, so on that note, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Burke, uh, good evening. And to Dr. Buchanan, good morning. And like I said, I think we definitely need to get you both back on here because uh, there's a lot more ground to explore. So for everyone else in the audience, thank you for joining us for this special evening edition of the broadcast. Don't forget, we have another episode coming in just a couple of days where we'll be joined by Dr. David Ulbrich of Norwich University, who's going to discuss insights and lessons from the twin Marine Corps amphibious studies of the interwar years, the tentative manual for lending operations of 1934, and uh, the less well known but uh, increasingly important tentative manual for defense of advanced bases from 1936. And he'll explore some connections to the recently released tentative manual for expeditionary advanced base operations in the Marine Corps. So that is this Wednesday, May 12th of 1400. Hope to see you all there and have a good evening and or morning. Good night. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.